What is Buddhist enlightenment? In some respects, we can think of it as the final goal of Buddhist practice, in some respects anyway. But what we're going to find with the concept of Buddhist enlightenment is that it changed significantly over time. I'll be looking in this video at two sort of aspects of enlightenment, one being the knowledge involved in it, and another being the result of that knowledge. And we'll see that ideas of both of these changed over time. So in this video, what I want to do is to start with one of the, or some of the early suttas, some of the early descriptions of enlightenment, the earliest ones we have, and look at those and what they might tell us, and then turn at the end to some uh, later developments about both the knowledge and the result involved in enlightenment. Now, a, a note here, in this video I'll be using the word enlightenment. Uh, we could also call it uh, awakening, so awakening and enlightenment are two uh, competing translations of the Pali or Sanskrit terms involved. I've done videos about uh, the fact that there are two different ones and, and what, the, what the arguments are for each of these translations. I'll leave links to those videos down below in the notes in case that is something that interests you. In the Buddha's Arya Paryesana Sutta, which may be the earliest or at least one of the earliest accounts of his enlightenment, the Buddha described it this way. He says, uh, the knowledge he gained was that my freedom is unshakable, this is my last rebirth, now there are no more future lives. And then he further goes on to say that he has come to understand the chain of dependent origination. Uh, however, nothing else is said. He does not, for example, describe the chain of dependent origination. He simply says that he's come to understand it. So, this account of enlightenment, of the knowledge gained, is very compressed. He only talks about uh, freedom, rebirth, that is to say the ending of rebirth, and this chain of dependent origination, and the fact that even the last of these, the chain of dependent origination, is not further described, at least holds open the possibility that this was a later interpolation, simply put into the text at some later point, once that uh, concept of dependent origination had been developed, which, at least from this text, we don't see any development. Now, the shortness and plainness of this text, the Arya Paryesana Sutta, at least when it comes to uh, the Buddha's enlightenment, is what leads uh, many scholars to believe that it's particularly early. However, there are other descriptions of the Buddha's enlightenment where he goes into a lot more detail, in particular where he talks about the sort of fame would have come to be the four famous three knowledges that are gained by the Buddha, were gained by the Buddha, on the night of his enlightenment. Uh, the Buddha describes these this way. The first of the knowledges is, I recollected my many kinds of past lives with features and details. The second uh, knowledge is, with clairvoyance that is purified and superhuman, I saw sentient beings passing away and being reborn, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, in a good place or a bad place. I understood how sentient beings are reborn according to their deeds or according to their karma. And the third of these knowledges that the Buddha gained is, I truly understood this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, this is the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering, that is to say, the Four Noble Truths. I truly understood these are the defilements, this is the origin of defilements, this is the cessation of defilements, this is the practice that leads to the cessation of defilements. Knowing and seeing like this, my mind was freed from the defilements of sensuality, desire to be reborn, and ignorance. When it was freed, I knew it was freed. I understood. Rebirth is ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence. Now, the astute among you will uh, notice that there are actually more than three knowledges gained on this night, because the third knowledge contains, in fact, a lot of different things known. Now, we've already mentioned that there are the Four Noble Truths. There's also four aspects of these defilements. There's also the fact of uh, the ending of rebirths, and the fact that the Buddha's mind was freed from those defilements, and, of course, all the aspects of the defilements. Uh, so, there's a lot here. 
And this at least implies to some scholars that there was a period where this third knowledge probably would have been added to over time. That is to say, when this text perhaps was first composed, there may have only been three knowledges. However, with time, that third knowledge became expanded as more was felt was needed to be added to that third knowledge in order to fill out the, uh, the complexity and fullness of the knowledge that the Buddha was understood to have gained on the night of his enlightenment. Now, so far we've been discussing the knowledge that the Buddha gained on the night of his enlightenment, but what about the results of that knowledge, or the results of the enlightenment experience itself? Those results are somewhat of a different matter. Now, they are to an extent included in the knowledge, that is to say, part of what, he knew, part of what uh, the Buddha learns or comes to understand is that these results have come to pass. And what in particular are those results? Uh, reading from the, the third knowledge that we've just described, Knowing and seeing like this, my mind was freed from the defilements of sensuality, desire to be reborn, and ignorance. Now, by sensuality, what's meant essentially is sense desire, which covers both, we might say, greed, that is, the wish for further sense desires that are pleasant, as well as aversion towards sense desires, or I should say, sense experiences that are not desirable. So it covers both of those, uh, both of those bases, if you like. And aversion itself covers uh, a broad range of negative states as well, such as anger, hatred, resentment, jealousy, and so on. So the results here involve an ending to the standard three fires, or three poisons as they're known, or come to be known, of greed, hatred, and delusion or ignorance. And the cessation of these fires comes from the cessation of craving, as in the Third Noble Truth. With the cessation of craving, comes the cessation of greed, of hatred, of ignorance, comes the cessation of dukkha, which is itself the first noble truth uh, and reflected in the second noble truth as well. And with that comes an ending to rebirths, to the round of rebirths in a traditional understanding. We can also understand this process as stemming from the ending of ignorance, as in the first link in the chain of dependent origination, the longer chain of dependent origination, because there are many chains. I won't get into that here, but in any event, in certain of those chains, they begin with ignorance. Ignorance is what sets the whole thing off. Once ignorance is undermined through the experience of enlightenment, that chain is broken. And this is the final result of enlightenment. So as we can see, in enlightenment, or I should say enlightenment itself, encompasses a lot of things known, and a lot of results, at least in the early texts. Still, in all of this long description of things known, I haven't mentioned non-self in particular. Now, in what is traditionally understood to be the Buddha's second sermon, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the Buddha discusses a route towards enlightenment that goes through knowledge of non-self. In that sermon, the Buddha is talking to his first disciples, his first five disciples, and tells them that they should contemplate their five aggregates, that is to say the five parts that go up into making uh, what we think of as, as ourselves, that is our body and mental aggregates, uh, feeling, perception, volitions, and consciousness. We should look at each of these aggregates and think of them as not I, not mine, and not myself. That is to say, see them and think of them as non-self. And if we come to understand the aggregates in this way, if we come to see them in this way and understand them deeply in this way, then we begin to cease clinging to them. We begin to cease craving them. We begin to cease identifying with them. And then we can reach enlightenment through that path. The Buddha says, they understand, rebirth is ended, the spiritual journey has been completed, what had to be done has been done, there is no return to any state of existence. In other words, this understanding comes through the understanding of non-self in this uh, second sermon. Now, this second sermon here seems to reflect more of what we might term the vipassana, or insight methodology, 
of reaching enlightenment. This methodology seems somewhat less to reflect the Buddha's own experience, since as we saw in the Buddha's own experience there's no mention of non-self in particular, but rather seems to be more the description of the path that he recommends to his first disciples. So we've gone through a lot just now. Um, let's do a step back and uh, recap here. I said we were going to look at both the knowledge involved in enlightenment and the results involved in enlightenment. Looking at three different early suttas, we see a growing amount of different kinds of knowledge gained in enlightenment. We saw that that knowledge encompassed uh, free, the knowledge of the freedom from bondage, knowledge of the ending of rebirths, knowledge of dependent origination, knowledge of past lives, knowledge of the workings of karma, knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, knowledge of various aspects about uh, the defilements, knowledge of the selfless, selfless nature of all phenomena, in particular of the five aggregates, as well as knowledge of the results of this knowledge. And what are the results of this knowledge? Or what are the results that come under the heading of enlightenment? Well, they involve the complete eradication of these very uh, uh, defilements. That is to say, on the one hand, greed, including greed for rebirth, desire for rebirth. Hatred, including many forms of dislike and, and, and related states. And ignorance. And with that, an ending, of course, of dukkha, and an ending in a traditional sense of rebirth. It's important to emphasize that in early Buddhism, any state, any experience uh, at all that does not eradicate completely greed, hatred, and delusion, or and all the related states of these, is not enlightenment. That's important to emphasize. Now, in the early text, there's no, no, there's no suggestion that enlightenment for the Buddha was any different from the enlightenment reached by other arahants. The Buddha was, was greater, of course, in his ability to teach, in his ability to discover the Dharma, and in his ability to found the order. However, in regard of his enlightenment, there was no distinction between the Buddhas and uh, those of other arahants. I've done a video about this in the past. If you want to learn more, I'll leave a link to that video down below in the notes. However, in later Buddhism, all of this whole uh, idea, this whole picture, began to change. Later on, uh, greater distinctions were made between the enlightenment of the Buddha, or indeed of Buddhas generally, and enlightenment of the arahants. At the same time, there was something of a reformulation of what sorts of knowledge were gained in enlightenment. As we saw in early Buddhism, the knowledge gained in enlightenment was about such things as the Four Noble Truths, about the ending of rebirth, about past lives, the workings of karma, uh, about dependent origination, about uh, non-self, and so on. In later Buddhism, the knowledge involved in enlightenment came, became more about knowledge of emptiness, knowledge of the non-dual nature of reality, in particular the non-duality of samsara and nirvana its, themselves, and uh, knowledge of uh, Buddha nature, the Buddha nature uh, inherent in all beings. Now, these three concepts of emptiness, of uh, non-duality, and of Buddha nature all are, I think, part and parcel of a much expanded concept of non-self in later Buddhism. Uh, the, the concept of non-self was expanded in these different directions to encompass these different ideas and ideals. As we saw, however, in the earliest suttas, non-self wasn't even really a part of enlightenment, at least not explicitly and directly, until, it seems, the Buddha's second sermon, when he was discussing the enlightenment with his first disciples. As regards uh, other knowledges uh, involved in enlightenment in later Buddhism, it didn't really encompass the same knowledge of the ending of rebirths that we saw in the earliest texts either, because Buddhas were understood to still be active in the world, in a way that hadn't been foreseen in the early texts. And indeed, when we really get down to it in later Buddhism, the, the knowledge involved in enlightenment was understood to one extent or another to be literal omniscience, the literal knowing of everything. 
it became more and more exalted and almost godlike, and this kind of docetism, what's known as docetism, was something that we saw increase as, as Buddhism went on. This, this, this belief, this structure in the, the texts that held that Buddhas were almost literally godlike in many respects. Or alternately, perhaps as a reaction to this kind of inflationary picture of enlightenment, we find in Zen, for example, what we might term a deflationary picture of enlightenment. So it's said in Zen that before enlightenment you chop wood and carry water, and after enlightenment you chop wood and carry water. This kind of picture is also reflected in the very famous ox herding pictures, which some of you may be familiar with. I can't go into them all right now, it's quite a, a, a deep and impressive kind of picture, but basically this is a, a series of pictures that encompass the path towards and through enlightenment. At the beginning, the person is looking for the ox, he finds the ox, then there's a kind of an enlightenment experience, but at the end, the, the, the person involved in this, in this path is back in the marketplace, back in the world. There's a sense of a circu almost, almost a cyclical kind of circular nature to this. This idea, I think, stems perhaps from one understanding or interpretation of the Heart Sutra, where we, we read that there really isn't anything such as ignorance. Ignorance isn't a real thing, nor is there an ending to ignorance. Wisdom isn't a real thing to be gained. And so therefore, the whole process of gaining some kind of knowledge and information becomes questioned. What is the knowledge gained? There isn't any real knowledge gained. It's no longer clear what knowledge or, or what results really do follow from enlightenment. So as we've seen, there has been a, there was indeed a drastic change in the history of the Buddhist Dharma about enlightenment, about the knowledge gained from enlightenment, about the results of that knowledge, about the kinds of enlightenment that one can gain. Is there one kind? Are there many kinds? Does enlightenment mean the end of our uh, experience in the world, the end of our ability to change the world, or indeed can we continue to have an effect in the world after attaining enlightenment? All of these are questions that came to be uh, disputed, I think, as time went on. One related aspect of this has to do with whether enlightenment itself is sudden or gradual. And this is, an asp this is a, a question that I did a, a video on a while back, terming it in that video awakening, so enlightenment and awakening, same thing. I will leave a link to that video up here on the screen if you haven't seen it or would like to see it again. Thanks so much. If you're getting something out of these videos, consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked down below and up here on the screen, and see if you want to help support the channel and the work that we're doing here. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.